I just want to welcome everybody here. I'm Nancy Bass Wyden. I'm the owner of the Strand Bookstore. For a little bit of history, it was founded by my grandfather, who is Benjamin Bass, in 1927. And it was located in an area called Book Row. There's even a book called Book Row. I have lots of props. Um, and it was uh, along 4th Avenue. It started at Astor Place and ended at Union Square. And at its height, there were 48 bookstores, all of shuttered. I guess Argosy moved uptown. They were only there for like five years. Um, and we continued to thrive here thanks to you avid book readers. Um, we have a, a active uh, event series. You guys all got um, some of the listings. We have 400 events a year, including one upstairs, one here, off sites. Um, so I just want to, I'm just so thrilled to be here amongst um, all these um, booksellers and book lovers. And um, I can honestly say that uh, Cleo Lee Tan's Book Lover's Guide to New York is a love letter to everything literary in New York. And you've covered all the bases from uh, bookshops, libraries, to homes, author interviews, and the haunts of, of world famous writers. And I think you started the book in 2013. No? No, that was my other book. Wonderful. And you've published a, a fiction you yes. fiction novel. 2013. Okay, got it. Um, anyway, as a having grown up in New York City in the world of books and being a bookworm myself, I found lots of things that I never knew about, including all these secret bookstore book um, libraries like the Andrew Heskel Braille and Talking Book Library, uh, all about drunk Shakespeare I never heard about, the Gramercy Typewriter uh, Company. Anyway, Cleo is a London, bro uh, London, bro <laughs> London bo born, and, um, and you're now you're New York based, and you grew up surrounded by books, your family's artistic and obs obsessive collectors, and your dad, Pierre Latan, was the illustrator for this book. And your sister, Olympia, designs, he, she's here, <laughs> designs uh, bookish things. And I have my clutch collection, too. They're limited editions. And they're, um, they're available um, at Bookmark. I heard there's a couple still there, yes, which is, the yes, <laughs> that are, that are, Oh, really? The next uh, one. But that, that's an original. Yeah. yeah. And you design shoes, so I'm wearing the cat, kitty cat shoes, too. <laughs> and um, anyway, I'm just so happy to have this panelist of indie booksellers uh, along with us. Um, I'd like to introduce Eric all the way at the at far end, Duran. He's the co-owner of Left Bank Books. It specializes in rare used and vintage books in all calibers of literature and the arts and children's books. And it's open on Perry Street in the West Village. Um, you were open before and now you're recently reopened. And I'd like to, uh, to talk about Holly Nicodim. Did I say that okay? Uh, the co-owner of Q and Willow Books in Q Gardens, Queens. Uh, you worked at the Barnes and Nobles in Forest Hills uh, which closed, and she realized that there was a void in Queens, and it needed a bookstore. So her, so uh, with her partner, she started a Kickstarter fund and started the bookstore there. And then Craig Mathis is here. He's the bookstore and dis distribution manager for Printed Matter, which is on 10th Avenue between 21st and 22nd Street. 26. Okay. Where am I getting this information from? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> and it's an interesting bookstore because it's a nonprofit. It started in 1976 and it runs the New York Art Book Fair. And prior to that, you were the operations manager at Powerhouse Arena, which was in Dumbo from 2007 and 2017. So, who said bookstores are and books are dead in New York and elsewhere? They're not, They're not dead. So I want to uh, start off with a question to Cleo, okay. 
which is um, tell us from the book what what new fascinating thing that you didn't expect um, uh, upon writing this book. Well, um, firstly, I didn't expect there to be as many um, bookshops and libraries and all that as I found. So the book started at first, it was going to be maybe, I think it was meant to be just under 100 pages, and I think it's 200 and maybe 50 <laughs> or something. So um, that was a fight with um, the Rizzoli. public. Yes, yes, it was a fight with Rizzoli, but it happened. And um, But one of the places that was quite uh, memorable was a, um, a l branch of New York Public Library in the subway. Um, so I don't know if many of you know it because it's very small. It's about the size of the man at the, with the orange sweater. Mm -hmm. So it kind of stops there and it's this size, maybe a bit bigger, all the way to the back, let's say. But anyway, it's very cool because it's on Lexington Avenue and early 50s, and it's um, you know in this sort of uh, uh, in front of this big office building, very modern and all that. And then you just sort of go in the subway and you go um, below ground. And right before the subway, to the left, is this door, and it says New York Public Library, and it's the Terence Cardinal Cook Library. And that was quite a cool discovery. Um, What's it like being uh, from such an artistic family? You know, does your uh, does your uh, and is does your mom and your brother to have these? Uh, yes, my brother. Uh, he has a um, he has an artist agency, so he used to be my dad's agent, um, and um, and my mom is. Um, uh, yeah, I mean she she likes nice things. <laughs> she yeah, <laughs> but I mean um, and. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's nice, uh, I guess. Um, uh, growing up in Paris, there was so many, <laughs> there was a lot of bookshops, more than here, I must say. So um, I'm a bit nervous about doing a Paris one because I feel like there'll be too many bookshops. It will be like 500 pages. Is that, that's your next ven venue? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can move on to other cities too, right? London yes, London, yes. Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, ca I counted in um, I, in the 1950s. There, there was a, a you know New York has always been an epicenter of of literary culture. I mean, it. I don't know if you know it came around uh, because of piracy originally. It was um, uh, in Benjamin Franklin's uh, day. It was centered in Philadelphia, and then it came. It shifted to New York because wow. of all the ships that were coming over. And America had no piracy laws. So um, the ships were coming over with books from England that they could immediately copy. Oh, wow. So then the books, then the, all the publishers started settling in, in here. And then in the, around the 1950s, they, um, there were uh, like 253 bookstores. And today I counted, including all the, like, the little ones, there's 79. But still going strong here. Um, Tell me, um, was there any was there any place that it was hard to get access to any of the um, libraries or? Well, uh, oh well, well that subway one was strange to to find. Um, I mean, I guess it was it was difficult to keep up because I feel like um, some of the bookshops uh, were moving away, sadly. But mm, I mean, most of them were very open and nice, I, I'd say. I'd say that it was probably, the best thing about the book was probably interviewing the people. Mm -hmm. So interviewing bookshop owners and the sellers on the street. And um, I remember, I mean, uh, again, it was funny with Rizzoli because the people in sales and, and marketing, they were uh, sort of against the, they were like, you cannot include the street sellers, you know, they steal from the bookshops and then they just resell them and they're not legit and blah, blah, blah. And I was very keen to include them and I managed to include them because mm -hmm. I think they're kind of cool and they're very sort of... You York. had Zachary was yes. the one I remember, yes. yeah. He was great, I loved him. And, the, and you know, there's the rise of the independence, so that's, you know, yes. which is happening and... Well, I wanted to thank all of you for being here. I'm so happy 
that you're you're all from sort of all these eclectic shops and you know I wanted to ask you Mick, can I ask them a few questions <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask them um, you know because uh, you, you're all from such different shops I wanted to know what you want what you expect what you want to give the customer when they walk into your shop um, all of you uh, something something that they've never seen before. I think that's what printed matter specializes in. Um, things that are uh, small press or artist made um, in small editions that are not commercially distributed um, or available on, uh, for the most part, on the internet. So people have to seek out um, our space as a destination for artist made publications. Um, and you know, and oftentimes people do travel from around the world to visit our store, and I think they take the opportunity to to thankfully um, collect as many things as they can and see uh, book collecting as um, you know not only as a, a sort of like a personal expression of kind of faith in what we're doing, but um, as you know, I don't know, uh, someone that appreciates the 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 direct connection to the artist because there are no distributors or agents or you know any of the sort of apparatus of like commercial publishing um, it really is uh, people that make things that drop them off in the shop um, that we you know uh, are lucky enough to have and you know present to people so that's yeah that's w what I hope people take away from our spaces um, for a little community bookstore like ours I guess what would really want people to take away from ours is a sense of comfort the biggest thing that we have going for us is that we're a place where people can come and interact with us. They can ask us questions, they can ask for book recommendations, or they can just tell us what they love. Um, we're, Q and Willow is very small, so we're all about having a very particularly curated set of books. So it's about listening to all of the people who walk into our door and reflecting what they want to see on the shelves so they feel very connected to the shop so I think that's kind of what we want them to take away yeah and, and left bank is is very similar I would say we're a small we're a very small specialty shop um, that focuses on used vintage and rare books we're about 200 square feet and at any given time have about four or five hundred books on the shelves um, and within you know the spheres of of interest that we have books in literature and art and music and photography and film and fashion and architecture and dance and theater it's you know it's all sort of arts related material um, you know we try to it's it's very streamlined but we try to make it very eclectic within within that field the books have a strong a visual or graphic component. We're really interested in sort of preserving the culture of the book in a digital era and, uh, you know, in an, in an age where people are sort of decluttering and getting rid of books and books are considered disposable commodities, we want to preserve, you know, preserve, preserve book culture and, and you know, if people are going to have one case of books or one shelf of books in their home, what are the books that are worth having and worth keeping? Um, and so, you know, it's it's eclectic, it's idiosyncratic, it's kind of a, a throwback to uh, a, a older New York, um, a, a kind of a New York that doesn't exist any longer. So we want to, you know, we want to create a, it's about the curation, and we want to create an experience for people, create an environment that's almost like a gallery uh, for the for the book and and that's how we sort of set it up and then and then it's also about community for us so that it's a place for people in the neighborhood to come and drop in and we know people their first names we know what their interests are we find books for people and um, you know sort of build bridges that way well um, in this um, era of internet and Amazon that you just sort of referred to do you think there is anything that um, maybe the city or politicians could do you know sort of like a cap on rent or something to help uh, you know like local bookshops and city you know physical stores I think like the community like um, voicing their concerns about Amazon moving to Long Island City and sort of somehow prohibiting that from happening is a good thing. 
I think they could do a, a good job at promoting us. You know, it's, it's saying these are specialty um, homegrown businesses and, you know, maybe not adding to any uh, bureaucratic, um, <laughs> um, adding any bureaucratic costs like landmarking wow. us or adding more taxes to us and more restrictions, you know, to, but I think really get behind the, the promotional part of it. And that's what, you know, the world, the world is so homogenous. I mean, people, and we have so many tourists in New York, they want to go to unique places. And they want to go to places like all of us that represent community. Um, Should we, do you guys want to ask some questions and then we can come back to? No? <laughs> yes? Um. I had a question for Chloe. First of all, I'm so happy that this book exists. And uh, I think we all have a lot of um, exploring to do after this. You should have released at the beginning of the spring, so the weather might be a little bit better. It, 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 was, it was, but it was my fault and uh, my father's fault, and we were very slow. It's OK. I mean, it, it was better now like than that. like spring of 2020, so I'm happy it's here. OK, good. Um, I was wondering a little bit about your writing process, having written a novel, and it sounds like maybe you're thinking now about um, writing another book. How did you feel that this writing and this exploration filled you versus sort of the creative um, world creation well, aspect of writing a novel? I have to confess that at first I wasn't... I liked the idea. I was keen on the idea of the book, and I thought it would be great, a great finished result, and I could picture it. But I wasn't really keen on writing the little write-ups because I thought it would be maybe a bit boring or to do. But in the end, I got into it, and I really liked, I loved adding all the interviews. I loved, you know, I loved meeting Nancy and doing that long interview. I loved... Um, interviewing Max from Printed Matter, and I loved sort of walking around and meeting the people, or including even people who don't have a bookshop, who are just book collectors or readers or writers. I feel like that was the most fun. Or sometimes, you know, sometimes I'd just get a city bike and I'd go all the way uptown, and I'd just sort of, because I, I live downtown, but I would go to five or six locations at the same time and talk to the people who worked there. And I loved sort of getting everybody's perspective like that. That was the most fun part. Uh, Max, can you tell us about, um, and then I'll go great, to you. Great, great. Can you tell us about how, what it's like to run an art fair and is, is that successful? Oh. And, um, well, uh, we have a we have a two women that run our um, New York and Los Angeles art book fairs, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think we had the, we just finished our fourteenth uh, in September at PS One. Uh, I think we had around thirty two thousand people over the course of three days visit the fair. Um, there are three hundred uh, plus artist exhibitors um, uh, from around the world. Um, I know it's hot sometimes at the fair if you visit it. <laughs> um, but anyways, uh, no, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's my favorite thing. It was my favorite thing to do as, um, you know, as a, not an employee, I would look forward to visiting the art book fair every year uh, because um, of the, you know, the majority of those projects are labors of love for the people that are making them. And for the people that supporting them, they, they are quite special. And, um, and so it's a bit of a dream to be on the other side of that and to, and also feel the weight of wanting to represent all of those projects in the most respectful way possible because um, because of the nature of uh, what people are creating um, and sort of um, it's, it's printed matter has been around for a very long time. We're one of the few uh, bookstores in the world that really specifically focus on artists' books. Um, so the fairs are a, a great focal point for community uh, to celebrate sort of all aspects of that. So yeah, um, I, Sinel and Emmy, my coworkers, who are the fair director and assistant coordinator, or coordinator are the really the, the ones that are, do the lion's share of the work. Uh, and yeah, they're amazing. And, uh, and everybody that contributes to that is, is amazing. So if you haven't gone, it's in September every year. Uh, and we also hold one in LA in April every year at the Geffen uh, MOCA, so yeah. Hi, I had a question for Q and Willow. And I just wanted to hear a bit about how you and your friends raise the money for the shop. It sounded quite impressive. Big fan of the book. 
Uh, thank you. Um, so it's it's a little humbling being here because we are kind of like the uh, the little little baby of the group, it seems. Um, we've been open for two years now, October made two years. Um, but we've been working on the project for about, we've been working on it for about four years. So my business partner and I had worked for the Barnes and Noble in Forest Hills. And at that point, um, all the Barnes and Nobles in Queens were closing. And my business partner realized that that was gonna leave pretty much um, just a s very small handful of bookstores throughout a giant borough. Um, so we decided that we were going to open a bookstore, kind of like you do when you're talking to your coworkers. Like, wouldn't it be so much fun if we opened our own store? Um, but a few of us took it very seriously and started trying to figure out how we would make it work. Uh, and one of the ideas that we came up with was crowdfunding. So we turned at the time to Kickstarter because it had the most um, brand name recognition and decided that we were going to start up a crowdfunding campaign to either earn our startup capital to get started or to at least gauge the community's interest. Um, if you're not familiar with Kickstarter, it's an all or nothing campaign. You either raise your money and you get your money or if you're even a dollar shy, you lose all of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was probably the most stressful two months of our life, um, but it really helped us cement exactly why we were doing what we were doing. People from mostly Queens, but all over the world, we had donors from Japan sending us, you know, one dollar to be like, I love what you're doing. We need bookstores. Keep going. Um, so it was incredibly empowering and we were really very lucky to be able to open our bookstore with our community at our back. How much money did you have to raise? Um, you? So we had set up a goal for ourselves of $70,000. And by the end of it, we raised about 72,000 with over 800 backers. Uh, were you able to get the, c the customers that used to go to Barnes and Nobles? Are they now going to your store? Uh, actually, yes. Uh, some of them don't realize the connection at first, and they'll come in and they'll look at us and go, I recognize you. You, <laughs> you, you used to help me at Barnes & Noble, didn't you? And I was like, yep. And they're like, oh, you're the ones who opened the bookstore. And we went, yeah, we are. And they're like, oh, we're so happy to see you're here. So it's been really nice. Uh, Eric, can, can you tell us what kind of books, uh, rare books people are collecting nowadays? Yeah, I mean, rare book collecting is sort of a, a, a maybe a conservative pursuit, and and the rare book world, the rare and antiquarian book world, has tended to be dominated by a strain of collecting known as high spot collecting, where people focus on singular titles in literature and history that just have broad recognition. Darwin, first editions of Darwin's Origin of Species, or Shakespeare folios or, or first editions of Dickens or Jane Austen, um, things like that. We don't specialize in that so much. That's kind of, um, that's very high end and, and also a very well tread path among dealers. So, you, you, you know, my background is in rare and antiquarian book selling at the high end. I worked at uh, Bowman Rare Books for about 15 years uh, before leaving and, and going to work at, at the old left bank and then reviving it. So what I've tried to do is import the model of rare book selling to, you know, to a more sort of updated, you know, sort of something a little more contemporary and a little more updated. So we focus a lot on, I mean, we do modern first editions, uh, you, you know, literature from primarily the 20th century, but we do a lot of design and, and photography and fashion and try to present those books as as cultural artifacts and do descriptive cataloging for them. Um, we're interested in people who will use books in their professional or creative practice. Uh, so uh, use books as a visual resource or a, or a creative resource. So um, yeah, I mean, uh, some books that we, you know, we bought recently were that, that we're excited about were Eve Babbitt's book uh, for Fia Rucci, which was published in 1982 and is really just a, a tour de force uh, in terms of, of design and, and illustration. It's a lot of fun. 
Um, we have some first American editions of Hermann Hesse novels and story collections that have original art by him in them. You know, we're, we're interested in sort of the marriage of text and image and like the, what the, you know, the, the technology of the book can do is that is not reproducible in, in, in other formats. Why did you close and why did you come back? Yeah, so, so I mean, Left, the, the Left Bank has been around in the village and, and was something of a neighborhood institution for over 20 years in one form or another, and it passed through multiple owners' hands and was in multiple locations. My partner, Jess Coronan, who's not here tonight, and I are the fourth ownership team of Left Bank, and we reside in the third location. We both went to work at the second location for the third owners in 2015, worked there for about a year, and it was really already sort of on a downward spiral. It was a neighborhood used bookshop in the traditional mold and was well loved, but it was not really viable financially because of overhead. And to that, you know, to that point, yeah, capping rent would be, would be a significant help, I think, for, for bookshops and for mom and pop shops in, in general. Um, but also it had some management issues and, and it wasn't very current in terms of its selection and it wasn't very stringent in terms of quality of material. So when it went out, Jess and I sort of regrouped and, and, and had the idea of relaunching it uh, and sort of reimagining it as a much more distilled uh, version of what it was. We retained the old shop's DNA as a used vintage and rare shop, but we've really boiled down the selection raised the price points and the quality a little bit and, and done much more targeted outreach through our website, through social media, and through our relationships with, with, our, with our customers. Oh, uh, no? Do you have any more questions? Does anybody have any questions? Since I have a panel of book lovers in front of me, I wonder if you've read anything great recently that you want to recommend to the room. Um, I read a, a collection of poems from Pasolini called the Roman Poems that I liked a lot. I like some easy reading. So I, I just read uh, Bill Bryson's The Body, which I just, I love how he, it, it, you know, writes so magically about um, it, just an appreciation for, for what we have here and, um, and, and what it does. And then I also um, read uh, Benjamin Moser's, um, it's a biography on Susan Sontag. It's so well done, and it's um, every and he was the the um, Sontags came to him and asked him to be the uh, biographer for her after after her death. Uh, if you haven't gotten to it yet, we um, we just did for the bookshops book club. They're there by Tommy Orange, and that was remarkable. And it was a debut novel, and it blew our socks off. Um, so it's kind of told in fragmented points of view that all converge at the end, and it's kind of biting, but poetic, but funny, but kind of sarcastic. It's very good, so you should pick that one up. Uh, the last thing that I finished that I can recommend is a, kind of a crazy-ass book that was published by uh, New York Review called uh, Charles Bovary, Country Doctor. It's sort of a hybrid novel essay about the character of, of Charles Bovary from Madame Bovary. It kind of tells his side of the story and then also e examines him as a, as a character and, and the way in which Flaubert kind of wronged him. It's a strange book by a Belgian Holocaust survivor named uh, Jean Améry. So it's interesting if you, if you are a fan of Madame Bovary. Um, I I liked uh, Sigrid Nunez's friend, mm -hmm. but I I had a baby not that long ago. So. <laughs> <laughs> Reading but board books right now. <laughs> it's, it's difficult. <laughs> but um, so uh, I would like to ask a question. Um, I would like to ask uh, all of you what the uh, nightmare customer in a bookshop consists in. <laughs> Who wants to go first? <laughs> but she seems, uh, Holly seems to have a 
a story there. It, no, it's not a specific. Okay, so <laughs> I'll give you, it just happened to me. It was the worst and the best customer. Um, so I had, I had somebody come in and he asks me for a very particular title. Um, if, if I haven't mentioned, we're small, so we don't have all the titles. So I offered to order it. Um, and he was making a great big deal about how if he wanted to order it, you know where he could order it from. And I was like, okay, um, well, let me help you, fi help you find something that's here. And he was giving me the toughest time, rolling his eyes, being like, well, I knew it was too good to be true. Uh, but then from behind me, the way our store is set up is my children's department is right over my shoulder. Um, this mother comes and very loudly says, excuse me, do you have a copy of, you know, the Velveteen Rabbit? And so we go, we pick it up, and we find a couple of really great local authors, and the whole time she comes down and she moves past the, uh, the other customer who was complaining and says very loudly, I'm so happy you're here. You don't know what you've done for our community. We love you. I'll order anything from you. And I'm like, oh, thank you so much. So um, probably the best and the worst in one little capsule moment. Um, I can't think of a specific instance, but you know, we're, we're in, we're, it, 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 we're in the village. It, there are a lot of eccentric folks that live there and have been there for, for ages. And the old shop was very much characterized by, um, kind of the people that, that hung out there. And it really was in many ways, sort of a, a, a social club for, uh, for, for neighborhood folks and for for poets and for old socialists in the neighborhood. And that is kind of what made it a cherished place, but it, w it was also, th th they, they weren't, you know, they weren't buying so much. And so they were kind <laughs> of <laughs> contributing to the, uh, to the sort of the, 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 the choking of the business. And it could be intimidating for customers to come in sometimes. So we still get, you know, we, we still get people, you know, opening, under the name Left Bank, but sort of reimagining it, we're very mindful of sort of maintaining continuity, but also doing things differently and doing things our way. And so we do get a lot of positive feedback from folks in the neighborhood that are very glad that we're there. Um, but we also get, you know, we get people who come in and immediately start regaling us with tales of the old shop as though we don't know about it, you know. <laughs> so that, that's, that's frustrating. I think for, for me, it would just be a customer that doesn't uh, understand the economics of and, and how much hard work it is to run a bookstore and maybe just keeps wanting more and more price reductions. <laughs> and um, I just, I, you know, there was, I don't know if you saw in today's New Yorker, there was an article about um, should we pay to enter a bookshop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, know. yeah, it was, well, he proposed a dollar, which is ridiculous Did but um, well the whole thing I think is just not not great but he actually found two bookstores that are that are charging for admissions there's one in Portugal and there's one in Japan they have the one in Japan has kind of an art gallery a component to it you pay $15 and it's all you can drink coffee and you get to stay there all day long and then the one in Portugal is architecturally just kind of beautiful and th it's a gift card to 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 um, to um, do that, so I think you know it just I I just said you know I say whenever I go in any town, I go to an independent bookstore and I always buy something because I think it's just such a treasured part of of the community and to be able to buy books and read books it's it's just a wonderful thing. If I could say one thing, if you're buying a gift for a friend, no one thing about that person. Just something, <laughs> something that, that the person that's like gonna run around the store trying to find something for your friend, that you know something about them. Just green or cowboys <laughs> or space. That's because oftentimes that's the, the, the worst and sometimes the most rewarding because if you do find something for that oftentimes indecisive and generally clueless person about their friend's interests, um, it feels good to get them something. Uh, but can be like, yeah, real exercise, like running around trying to to decipher what they're looking for. So. you guys have any questions? None of you have said anything about people damaging books. 
I imagine that that was going to be the response to the nightmare customer. In my old store, yeah, because we used to have a lot of really big events, and a lot of those events had alcohol as a component. So, yeah, like using a book as a uh, coaster uh, was like an everyday thing. But in, in printed matter, I think most people realize, you know, the types of books, so they're pretty respectful. There's so many people that just come by. No? I think it, um, for us, it's just, it's, it's a small component of it. I, I remember um, we considered um, putting in a coffee bar, and I talked to Michael Powell's out in Portland, Oregon, and he said that was the number one thing that, that he didn't want to put in the coffee bar because he thought so many books would be damaged, and then the reality is that hardly any were. So it's just, it's part of the cost of doing business, I think. Um. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions? Any more questions? Was your decision not to do the coffee bar because there are so many coffee shops around the neighborhood, or what was that? I think, you know, I don't know, um, you know, my grandfather started and it was just a used bookstore and uh, of course he had his troubles. I mean, there were, four, there were so many competitors and there, you know, even one of the bookstores on Book Row was called the cheapest bookstore in the world. And they were all fighting to, to get inventory and everything. But, you know, bounce back to today's model and we're, you know, we're running an internet, we're running event series, we have, you know, um, authors come in, we have our own sidelines. I think uh, we have used books, rare books, new books. It's just so much going on at once. And, you know, I think, you know, there's added complications too with, you know, I'm su we're supporting 238 employees. And so I've explored it so many times and I could never, <coughs> it, it just, it felt like that's a whole nother thing to, to, uh, to learn. Although it's always historically been part of a, um, a bookstore, you know, the idea that you're going to drink coffee and you're going to exchange ideas. So I haven't, I haven't taken it off the table, here. but I don't know that I'm ready for it. <laughs> Have you guys considered uh, coffee or no? Yeah, that's, that, that's kind of my. <laughs> I prefer it without coffee, I think. You do. It's, it's a little bit purer. One of the cool things actually um, in our town because we don't have coffee is we get to tell people where the good coffee is. So it helps the other small businesses in the area too, because we'll tell them, oh, go over, you know, go over the train bridge. There's great coffee over there. And then they'll go when the people come in, oh, you're looking for something to do. There's a bookstore over the bridge. <laughs> so it's really kind of just helped foster the sense of community, not having a coffee in our shop. Symbiotic relationship, right? Anybody else? Um, I was just wondering, after exploring a lot of different book spaces in New York, what you feel like makes the book culture in New York distinct from other places in the world? And anyone can answer this, but I was just curious. <laughs> um, I liked the variety of all the shops, and I think tonight's a great example because they're all from such eclectic sort of shops and they all sell such different books and I thought that was great. Um, you got rare books, you got sort of um, just small independent bookshops, huge independent bookshops, uh, artist books and just I loved having everything and, and even the rare books as Eric was saying earlier, they've I feel like Left Bank Books now, the new one is sort of like the evolution of rare books because that place where you used to work, Borman, is so sort of stuffy and um, it's just kind of, now it's your shop is so m much more refreshing and so I like all, all the variety and I like that, but I don't know. Should we take like two more questions? Is that sound good? Go ahead. You want to ask a question? Oh, I was just going to say just, you know, the... New York is just a reflection of the people that are here. So oftentimes, like, you know, like your shop, you know, you're, you're stocking it with, you know, with your community in mind. So, and because it's, you know, it's a global city, you also have all these influences from everywhere. So, and thankfully we have, um, uh, uh, you know, a city full of people that can support, e even though it may have diminished over the decades, um, you know, quite a few independent bookshops, both in 
Manhattan and Brooklyn and Queens, um, and then they all have a very distinctive character. And a lot of times at my shop, just because we are so uh, specific to arts publications, you know, we're often, uh, I probably recommend people going to Strand's design department. Right here. Yeah, right there, <laughs> half a dozen times, or if they're looking for photography specific dashwood, or if they're looking for like a really super curated, like contemporary bookstore with used stuff masked. And, there's just there's new shops opening all the time, um, you know, and so and and really well established, well curated, well uh, uh, sort of like cared for shops, and um, and you're right, like you know, buying something supporting them helps all those places retain their character and try and you know uh, be as unique and special and valuable as they can be. So. I think um, having uh, so many cultured people here, people interested in the culture, and then um, also people's home libraries um, are fantastic. And so we get that some, sometimes um, on the in the used and rare book market too. Yeah. Here, I um, mean, I think having access to authors today. Patty Smith was in um, signing her latest copy. So um, and and you know, you live here. Um, so I think it's it's a very cultured, interested group of um, of clientele that live in on this island and other and Brooklyn and the surrounding island. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'll second that too. I mean, it's a it's a joy to my favorite aspect of the job is is buying, and it's a joy to and I make house calls, so it's a joy to go to folks people's homes in the in the village and and people who have lived there for decades and sort of see how people live and, and how they live with books and, you know, just small apartments that are overrun with books and, and you know, being able to see that up close and is, is a privilege. A uh, last question or, okay. This is our, this is Sabir. He, he runs our whole events program. Sorry to cheat and ask a question, but I was curious, why book selling for all of you? Like what's the impetus? I just like being around, like being in a room full of books. Like, <laughs> I, I, it just makes me feel good to go to work, like knowing that I'm gonna be getting deliveries of things, and especially now at Printed Matter, we have an open submission program, so anybody can drop off books for consideration. We don't accept everything, but yeah, every day we get new things in the mail, in person, you know, and um, it's, uh, I don't know, it's really, um, I don't know, it's like, a uh, it's hard to describe, but uh, for me, um, I can't imagine like wanting to to go somewhere five days or however long a week, you know, d uh, you know, days a week to uh, and not be, you know, feeling and being exposed to those things. So, I was born in the right family. <laughs> 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 I, you know, I think it's just such a you know heartfelt, rich life, and and you know when I have to deal with money stuff, I just it's so boring. <laughs> Okay, last, last question for Olympia. Um, speaking of buying books, from these books that you hunt for or that you're proposed, what percentage of them do you want to keep for yourself or do you actually keep for yourself? I have like three stacks on my desk right now that so are... One of each. <laughs> I mean, well, no, I mean, they're like stacks of stuff. So it's like if you work in a record store, you're always hoarding like all of those things that come in. Like I work in a bookstore, so I have like stuff that I'm just waiting to buy and hopefully before they sell and then sometimes I have to sell them because other people want <laughs> them. <laughs> I mean I feel like for me that acquisitive impulse is satisfied by buying them for the shop and they are technically my books until until I sell them and <laughs> I spend all my time with them so it's my yeah it's my it's my book collection away from home. There's a, uh, there's a saying that's been going around recently, which is I have found that reading books and buying books are two separate hobbies. Um, it's true. Um, so there are a lot of times where we'll be building our orders and we'll see things that we want and we go, I'm just gonna put that in there. Uh, you don't always get to buy all the books that you want, but as you were saying, it's just as satisfying getting other people to be as excited about the books that you wanted and then you tell them to read it and then come back and give you a little book report and it's fun. I think you know you want to you want to have great 
books for your customers. You want to always have fresh inventory. Uh, this is a bag. This is my a picture of my dad, and he worked on the at the buying desk. Um, he worked at the bookstore from age 13 to age 89. He, um, but he, uh, you know, he had that problem, and so he said he's just going to limit himself. He was going to, um, he was crazy about Henry Matisse, so he um, he bought he he had everything that was Henry Matisse, but then he started getting a little crazy with that because then he had anything that had any kind of reference to Henry Matisse. <laughs> so it was just so much secondary material, you know, if it was an encyclopedia and they had a, you know. Uh, you know, the 11th edition Britannica, he would have that in his collection. So my mother was upset with him and it got out of hand and he, he eventually sold off some of it, but I think you really have to hold the reins on, on that. <laughs> so should we get to the book signing part Let's of it? Let's do it. Okay. Let's do it. Thank you, Craig and Eric and Holly and Cleo. And anybody that bought a book, um, you have... Bookmarks all designed with tassels and thank you all for coming to this. So nice.